In today's video, we'll talk about HTTP files, what they are, how to read them and understand what's going on there, and also how to send HTTP requests via Visual Studio Code's REST client extension, plus how to define environment variables, and also how I like to organize my requests into files and in folders, etc. By the end of this video, then you'll be completely sold on why HTTP files is just the ultimate way to manage your requests. You'll delete Postman, you'll delete any other client that you have on your computer, and you'll be forever converted to HTTP files. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. My name is Amichai, and in this channel, I talk about software architecture, developer tools, best practices, things that you really want to be familiar with, if you're a software engineer. This video is part four in a series in which we're building a REST API completely from scratch following best practices, ASP.NET 8, and much, much more. So if you don't wanna miss out on that, then make sure to smash the subscribe button. In any case, this video can be watched standalone from the overall series. So what is an HTTP file? Well, basically it's a file that has the .http suffix. So if I go ahead and say over here something, and then I get the HTTP suffix, then I went ahead and I created an HTTP file. Now, the format that we use within the file is respected across various IDEs and editors. When I say respected, I mean you'll have syntax highlighting, you'll be able to navigate to definition, we'll look at variables in a few minutes, plus in many of the IDEs or editors, then you either have a built-in support or an extension that allows you to actually send the request from within your editor or IDE. So for example, if I go ahead and say get, and I put over here google.com, and I have this send request button over here, then when I send the request, then I'll get the actual response for calling google.com. Now, of course, it doesn't end there. So you can go ahead and also put over here whatever headers that you want. So for example, if you have some bearer token, then you can go ahead and say bearer and then specify your specific token. Then below, then you have the actual request body. So the format is you have the HTTP method, you have the URI, then you have all the various headers and then you have the request body. Now, the way that I like structuring it is the following. So let's imagine that we're working at an application where we have products and reviews for products. Then what we can have is the following. We can have over here a folder called products, and we can also have a folder called reviews. Then what I like doing is creating a file per request. So for example, if we want to go ahead and create a product, then this will be the create product file. Now, if we want to go ahead and define another request in the same file, then we can simply go ahead and put three slashes and then put whatever request we want below. And we can see that we have over here the send request option. But I don't like putting everything in one file because very quickly it becomes very large and it's not as easy to navigate across the various requests as simply taking each one of the requests and putting it in its own file. Now, real quick, before we continue, I want to remind you that I have four comprehensive courses on Dome Train. I take you from zero to hero on both clean architecture and domain driven design, where I cover more or less everything you need to know when you're building production applications that are following clean architecture and domain driven design. As far as I know, and very objectively, then I think these are the most comprehensive courses on these topics. And basically what I did is I took my experience and knowledge around these topics, plus a ton of research, and I've compiled what I believe to be the ultimate way to learn each one of these topics. So if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check out the links in the description. Now, back to the video. Now, you're probably looking at this and you're thinking to yourself, what happens when I need to go ahead and update the token. So my token expired. Do I actually need to go over each of the files and paste my token over here? So the answer is, of course not. What we can do is to open the extensions and look for REST client and install this extension, which allows you to do the following thing. First of all, we can go ahead and define this token as a variable. And right away, we can see that we have this squiggly line telling us that this variable is undefined. To define a variable, all we need to do is the following. If we want the scope to be the specific file that we're in, then we can go ahead and put this at symbol and then put the name of the variable. And over here, we can put whatever we want the value to be. Then we also have here IntelliSense where we can see where this variable is used. And also if we hover over the actual token, then we'll see over here the underlying value. We can also notice that this is a file variable and not a global or more correctly an environment variable. 
Now, the reason I'm saying that is because that if we go to the create review, for example, then we put over here these curly brackets again, then this again is not defined because the scope of the variable was only the file. So if we paste this here, then the error goes away. But because we don't want to go through all the various files, because that's what we tried to avoid with the variable in the first place, then what we want to do is to create an environment variable. To create an environment variable, what we want is to open the settings and in the settings, search for rest and env. This will give us the environment variables settings for the rest client extension. Now notice that we can either update the setting for the user or we can update the setting for the workspace. Now currently user is selected and if we keep it selected and we click edit in settings JSON, then we'll be updating the settings for the user and this will be across projects as well. But because we want our environment variables to be relevant only in this workspace, then we'll instead of selecting user, then we'll select workspace and click edit in settings JSON. What this will do is it'll open this settings JSON file, which is sitting under .vs code. If this folder doesn't exist, then it'll create this folder as well. And then what we have is the following. We can go ahead and define various environments. So we can say, for example, that we have the dev environment and in the dev environment, then we have the variable token. And over here, this is the value for this variable. Likewise, we can also have another environment, for example, staging, and here we'll have the staging token, and we can also have another one, let's say prod, and then we'll have the value for this token. Once we have this, then we can go ahead and open the command palette and click rest client switch environment. This will list all the environments that we created, and then all we need to do is simply select the one that we want and now this is what will be used. So if we go ahead and update this to EY, let's say dot dot and then dev, then now going to any HTTP file, then we can go ahead and turn this into a variable. And now if we hover over it, then we can see that this is an environment variable. The value is really what we defined in the settings JSON, and this will be used across all the various files. Now, as you can see, each one of these variables is local to that specific environment. If you want to have sort of these global variables that are available no matter what environment that you're in, then you can go ahead and say, for example, let's say product ID and create over here your specific variable. And once you have this, then you can go to let's say get product and replace this with product ID. And this over here will work regardless of the environment that you choose. And the beauty is that once you have this defined for all the various variables that you're going to use, then it's very simple to go ahead and define new endpoints and update the value for a variable and it will be updated throughout all your HTTP files. Now, I'm sure you can imagine just how powerful this is for when you want to go ahead and on board to a new service or you're cloning some GitHub repository and it works with HTTP files, then it's first of all, very simple to understand what the heck is going on. And also you can simply go ahead and make a request using the definition that the developers actually use to develop locally. Not only that, but you can go ahead and link to the actual requests from your documentation. So you have internal documentation for various things then you can go ahead and link to the underlying source code and the underlying request definitions. So that's HTTP files. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. In the upcoming videos, then we'll actually start implementing these endpoints. We'll talk about application logic versus domain logic versus presentation logic. We'll talk about logging, error handling, Docker support, and many other things that you really must be familiar with when you're building a REST API. So if that sounds interesting, make sure to smash the subscribe button. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. If you did, smash the like button, why not? And I'll see you in the next one.